um, and some amazing students and their teacher coming live from Egypt, um, Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt at COP27. Uh, if you are here, uh, we'd love to know who you are. We'd love to um, for you to stay on mute um, while um, while you're watching. Um, we will have time for questions at the end as well. So um, that's where you'll find that. There is closed captioning that you can enable if you need that. Um, and that is found back, uh, down in the right-hand corner of your screen. Um, so if uh, that's something that would be useful, please go ahead and do that. We are streaming this um, to Facebook as well. So uh, hello to all of our Facebook viewers that are out there in the world. Um, I want to start just by um, asking and encouraging everyone that is here to reflect on where you are in the lands you occupy. I am coming to you from the occupied um, lands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe people. Um, we know that the United Nations um, recognizes the rights of indigenous peoples. And we think about this a lot, especially when we um, are in places like the COP, um, where we have folks from around the world representing their cultures, their communities, and their knowledge. And we know that um, indigenous knowledge is knowledge that tells us how we should be living on this planet. Um, and, and we can be doing it in a sustainable way. Uh, we also want to acknowledge that this is the Africa COP. So this is a conference being held on the continent of Africa. Um, and uh, Africa um, is of course where um, the enslaved peoples that came were brought here forcibly to the United States helped build the country that we're in. Um, and I think that is uh, something really important for us to think about when we go back to this continent of Africa and we're living on that. Um, that the folks um, that helped build the country we're on were actually forcibly brought here from Africa. Our organization's uh, mission is to ignite and sustain the ability of educators, youth, and communities to act on the systems perpetuating the climate crisis. We're really excited um, every year to be sending delegation to the COP because this is a place where all those systems are on display and we get to actually um, see the government systems, the social systems, youth, different sectors trying to work together to solve this problem. Um, and we get to support uh, voices of youth and educators and others on the front line of the climate crisis um, to have a voice and, um, and think about how um, they can take a part in, in making change and, and help us all learn themselves, which is why we're here today, to learn from some young people that are learning about that. I'm going to turn it over to Rachel Rosner, who um, is going to tell us a little bit about It's Our Future and some of the orgs of our partners. Hi, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here in Egypt with these uh, amazing young leaders. And I could talk about them for the whole hour, but I know you'd rather hear from them. Thank you so much to Kristen and the folks at Climate Generation for making this happen and for uh, getting badges for those of us who needed it to attend this conference. It's Our Future is a youth-driven climate advocacy program that connects Chicago area youth working for strong climate and environmental justice policy in their schools and communities. Can you guys hear me okay or is it too loud out here? I think we're okay, right? Okay. Um, so we meet monthly via Zoom and host youth-led and in-person events. And so please follow us at IOF Youth on Instagram and Chicago area youth, you can go ahead and scan that QR code in order to join our ranks. Uh, and then, yeah, we can move on to the next slide. Um, Seven Generations Ahead was founded by Gary Kinnean, which it looks like many of you know, because the chat is so alive, which is really fun to watch. It's 21 year old organization, 21 year old organization that does amazing work in uh, communities in the Chicago area. And it's our future is also Gary's brainchild and he's done an amazing job of shepherding this youth through this incredible conference experience. So yay, Gary. Um, and a huge thank you to One Earth Collective and Garcia Doyle, who has done an amazing job putting this event so many folks here and um, they also hosted a 
filmmaking workshop before our youth went and they're going to be working our, our youth are going to be working to make a film about this experience for the youth content filmmaking contest a film contest of, of one earth collective so very excited about that anna's helped us produce helped our youth to produce lots of other amazing events so um i know we have um some groups uh watching from different schools i i want to shout out Diana Balitan at ETHS, which is my alma mater. I know she's got a group with her, OPRF. I see Ms. Wong is on there. I hope there's a, a room full of kids with you. Let us know in the chat. I know um, Tasha is watching with her environmental club at Hinsdale uh, Central High School. And Danica has her environmental club there at uh, Illinois Meth and Science Academy. Any other schools? Oh, Solorio for crying out loud. Okay, thank you. Uh, I know it's so excited that Solorio folks are in the house uh, to celebrate Fatima, Greta, and Antonio. And I know you're going to love hearing what they have to say. And I do want to thank our MCs tonight, uh, Tasha and Danica, who have been really active with It's Our Future. And I know they're going to do a great job. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Back to you, Kristen. Thanks. Awesome. Um, and just a note, you may hear some little delays and things. Um, we are, as you know, talking to folks in Egypt. Um, and so we might have a little um, delay in uh, Wi-Fi occasionally, but we're hoping we can keep things rolling uh, without little hiccups like that. But who knows? We have to we have to work with it sometimes. Um, as I mentioned, Climate Generation has a delegation at on the ground um, at COP as well. And it does include Greta and Fatima, who are going to be speaking with us today. Um, they're sort of sharing um, the space with Climate Gen and it's our future. Um, and we encourage you to, to follow our other um, our other delegates as well. And, um, we have information here on how to do that. And I'll have um, Claire, who's on from our staff, we put in the chat how you can do that. Um, there are, if this is something you're like, whoa, this is so fascinating, this COP stuff, I want to learn more. There is another opportunity next week to hear from another um, part of the Climate Gen delegation coming in live um, at 11 o'clock Central Time on the 17th. And we already did that. So um, for those of you that are out there and you're saying, you keep saying this word COP, what the heck is going on? What is COP? Um, we're going to give you the 101 in two seconds here. COP is the Conference of the Parties. The Conference of the Parties is a conference that occurs annually. This is the 27th one, COP 27. And it happens under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This convention was established to help us solve the climate crisis at an international and global level people from around the world come together at conferences throughout the year to prepare for the Conference of the Parties. And the parties are countries. A country is a party. There's 197 parties to this conference. Um, this is a conference where you say, gosh, I wish I could talk to someone from Namibia. And you probably will be able to find someone because there's 197 um, countries that are represented. Um, we are still trying to make progress on that, but the role of youth um, and in these conference spaces is absolutely critical because they are our voice and reminder of what needs to get done. And they actually um, show up in some really interesting ways in, um, at the conferences. And I'm just really excited to hear from these folks, um, these high schoolers that are there right now about their experience and how they're using their voice at the conference. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Donica to be, um, as our first MC. Take it away, Donica. Thank you, and hello, everyone. So our first delegate for today is Fatima. She is a senior at Solorio Academy, where she has been active with the Zero Waste Warriors, Zero Waste Ambassadors. She is Mexican-American and lives in West Lawn, Chicago, and her purpose in attending COP27 this year is to empower youth to take action. So also from Solorio Academy, we have Antonio. He's another senior there, and he is also part of the Zero Waste Ambassadors. And outside of Solorio Academy, he's also a member of the Chicago Climate Youth Coalition. Antonio is attending COP27 to learn more about environmental issues and bring this awareness back to his community. 
So finally, we have Greta. Greta is a teacher at Solorio Academy in Chicago, where she teaches AP Environmental Science, Chemistry, and Biology, and advises the Zero Waste Ambassadors Club. Her club works to restore local forests, manage their school composting program, and hold sustainability education events at Solori Academy. So I'll pass it off to Tasha to include the rest. Um, our next delegate is Manolo. Manolo is a junior at Oak Park River Forest High School, and he leads their environmental club. Uh, his purpose in attending COP27 is to learn more about policy and governmental actions with regard to the environment. Next from Oak Park is Tori. Tori is a senior at Oak Park and River Forest High School, where she's the captain of the swim team. She is attending COP27 to learn about how international relations play into climate-oriented policy creation. And finally, Edmund is a senior at Evanston Township High School, and he is the hub coordinator for E-Town Sunrise. Emma is interested in learning more about sustainable urban development and how scientific cooperation can impact our environment. Fatima, if you want to take it away. Just go. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Hi, my name is Fatima. Thank you for introducing me, uh, Danica. Um, so I'll start. So you can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so here I just I've included photos of like um, my general experiences in Egypt. The first photo is just our view of Sharm el Sheikh as we arrived. Um, for me, this was just like a big experience because I've never even been across the Atlantic. Um, and it was really cool because it had been a long, long day um, of being at the airport. So it felt nice to finally arrive. Um, and then the middle photo, um, it's us leaving uh, the conference venue. I hear like, you can't really see the sunset, but the sun was about to set, um, which is pretty much what happened every single time we were leaving the venue. Um, we woke up, like we left every single day, like at 7.30 and got there like at 8.15. Um, but by the time we were coming out, it was like, it was gonna turn dark. Um, so that was like our general, the general pattern we saw. Um, and then the last photo is just the first photo that I took once we arrived at the venue. That was like the, whoa, we're here moment, right? Um, so I took a photo of that. And I think just like in terms of like my general impressions, it was just really cool. Um, and like, like I said, it was just like the big moment. But yeah, that's all I have to say about these. Um, now these photos, uh, these are more just in the blues. Like this is part, uh, was part in the blue zone. Uh, where most of the pavilions uh, were at. So the first uh, photo is of the Sweden pavilion. Uh, here we had three people speaking. Um, and I think this was like the first pavilion that we sat in where I really got in the groove of taking notes and stuff. Um, here, uh, the delegates who are pictured were discussing uh, the financing of developing countries and the fact that it's crucial, however, also that there should be a focus um, to find the ideas that people in these underdeveloped countries have, not just the projects that are being developed by the private sector in developed countries. Um, and so underdeveloped countries already have solutions. That was something that they really emphasized. Um, and also just to like center the conversation around the inclusion of youth, uh, which was something that uh, Vlad, who's on the far most um, right um, was talking about. He's a youth uh, like representative for the UN. Um, so that's something he emphasized and just in terms of like inclusivity for decision making and policy, uh, but also just developing skills and the youth workforce because it's needed in order to create innovative um, solutions for climate change. Um, so that's all I have to say about the student pavilion. It was great. Um, and then, wait, sorry. No. Yeah. Uh, then this uh, in the middle is the Children and Youth Pavilion. Um, it was an ecocide discussion. Um, so the Youth Pavilion, like the first day we got there was kind of, it wasn't empty, but people were just were not actually in the place where sessions were occurring. But the next time we were there, they were actually holding sessions and it was great energy just to be around youth. Um, the youth here at COP is technically not us, like people in high school. It's a range between like 20 to 30 years old and actually 
Kringle is actually considered youth under the <laughs> definition of the UN, <laughs> which is funny. Um, but here picture we have uh, Leah um, Wayman who spoke about um, codifying ecocide as an international crime. Uh, per the definition presented on the screen, you can't really see it, so I'm gonna read it. Um, is an unlawful or wanton or wanton acts committed with the knowledge that there is substantial likelihood of severe or either widespread uh, or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. Um, she went on to read two very impactful poems, in my opinion, from her um, book, Dear Earth. Uh, the first poem was uh, focused on, like, it was very optimistic. It had a very optimistic approach, um, given that it was about her appreciation and connection to nature. Um, however, it was followed with, like, a shift in tone, wherein she read a poem titled Paradise is Burning, um, essentially capturing much of the emotions that we all feel when we think about um, the impacts of climate change, hashtag climate change anxiety, right? Um, so, and the overall message was just that we must hold large corporations accountable as they are the ones that are frequently committing ecocide essentially, right? Um, we don't think about, I think often about the impact that these uh, large corporations are having in, in the world for, due to climate, for climate change um, as a crime. We just think about them as bad actions, but they could actually be codified into actual crimes, which maybe would help because then they wouldn't, oh, that's five minutes. I'm sorry. The next <laughs> image is of me, uh, Tori and I at the US Center. Um, this is a photo that we took after listening to John Kerry, uh, the man we had been looking for the whole entire time. <laughs> um, and shortly after he uh, stopped talking, which most of his speech was just stuff we already know, uh, but it was still nice to see him. Uh, me and Emma chased after him. Um, we did a lot of running after him. We couldn't get him for an interview, which is the ultimate goal, but it was fine. I guess it was fun to run. I haven't run in a while. Um, yeah, and now here, uh, getting to my primary focus, which is the impact on indigenous communities. Um, they're here at the Moana Blue Pacific Pavilion, I would say was like my best experience in terms of like an actual organized punctual uh, pavilion because some of the pavilions were not punctual at all. It was a little bit of chaos. But here I listened to their uh, KOA emergency declaration. Um, and it was just great because the way it was organized was phenomenal in terms of just having every member share their experience and their story. Um, shortly after the pavilion session ended, I actually um, interviewed one of the members who just sort of told me about um, his experience and the land where he lived in. Um, and the fact that it's just really the declaration is for the purpose of future generations um, and that they're not willing to become refugees again because they've been through that before. Um, and then the middle image is was at the safeguarding rights of indigenous peoples and in business driven climate action, essentially just saying that a lot of the times uh, big corporations in the private sector, when they create solutions, um, they don't they completely disregard um, the, the input of indigenous peoples and often just locate solutions like wind turbines on indigenous land without thinking about the impact that that can have on their culture and their everyday lives. If you affect indigenous people's everyday lives, you're affecting the practice of their culture and just in general, the community that they live in, which then starts to fall apart. Uh, and then the last one was the uh, Climate Justice Alliance booth in which I spoke to someone who's actually connected to uh, an indigenous group um, organization here in Little in Little Village in Chicago, which is cool because I live so close to there. Um, and he essentially focused um, his, I actually interviewed him, which was focused on the fact that, again, oftentimes uh, the private sector isn't financing indigenous peoples or uh, underdeveloped countries in the correct way and just use their climate solutions for the purpose of driving their, um, economic development, which again, just contributes to like uh, an endless cycle of bad capitalism. Um, and honestly, that's all I have to say. I think uh, I had a pretty good experience in finding um, stuff on my topic and even today, but that would go even longer. I've really <laughs> gone over my limit, I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. And I just, I, I that was fantastic. And I'm gonna be a little bit harder about the time with the rest of you. So just be prepared because uh, watch the chat for that one minute warning. There, okay. Antonio, take it away. All right, cool. I'm very excited to be here. You can go next slide. 
Okay, so my general experience. Initially, I was very nervous, very scared. For In one aspect, I'm leaving my family and I'm going to this place where there's a lot of uncertainty. I don't know whether or not I'm going to go to jail for something, doing something like really basic or saying something like wrong. But at the same time, I'm really thrilled because I have this opportunity. Um, and also, I initially thought like, well, cop might just be like a, like get, like doesn't result to anything, right? Um, but I'm like, but once I stepped in like Egypt, I'm like, oh man, this is really different. This is like a different world than what I'm used to. The air is different. The sand is different. The water is different. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, take advantage of it. And so I went, I'm like, okay, I'm going to talk to as many people as possible, really push myself, really become sociable and try new things. And so I got to talk to people from around the world, which is really impressive how different they all are. Ask people like, what song recommendations would you have from your country? What phrases do you have in your language, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, and I also have done different things, such as snorkeling. And all this accumulated just makes me really grateful for the opportunity that I have. So yeah, next slide. Now, when it comes to COP, it, there's many different zones. So there's the innovation zone. And the main focus within this group, this hub, was hydropower, communication, investments, and other technologies. You can see an image of me with John Labista. I, also, I almost want to say um, Batista, right? But he's the White House Chief of Staff. Um, and he spoke primarily about the need for investment to be channeled within certain sectors, such as cement making. Um, and then there's other interviews I had, such as I think the vice president of a hydropower company, um, another man who was in charge of this company named GMC, I believe, or CMG, some along those lines which basically had mayors communicate from across the world um, and many different other people involving within these sectors. Um, within the Blue Zone, there was a lot of focus on negotiations, commitments, and inclusion. So as you can see, there's like an actual negotiation happening within a new project that uh, is being made involving plastic bags being smart. Um, it's really interesting if you wanna know more about that. But even aside that, like outside of just these booths being presented to the rest of the people, there's people in the back just talking to each other, making like, deals with each other, um, which is really interesting. And then obviously you see here in the bottom, there's indigenous people talking about, well, you know, we need to be considered within the conversation. Um, and I think that these people are generally very proud of what they're saying, very passionate. And I'm really happy that they're included. I think it's really great that we have a lot of African countries involved within this COP. Next slide. Now my main focus area is actually energy in the Caribbean. Primarily because I'm Puerto Rican and I know that like uh, sustainable infrastructure that um, can be managed even throughout like a, a tropical storm is really difficult. My family has been affected by that. So I wanted to focus on this area. Next slide. So unfortunately there wasn't a lot of Caribbean representation. Um, there's only like snippets here and there or even like actual, I guess, over sections, intersections. Um, but I think it's some people. So for example, I saw with the prime minister of the Bahamas. He's a really friendly guy. I think most people there are probably going to be very friendly. Um, but they generally talked about loss and damage and need for a stable infrastructure, um, a infrastructure for capital to move, and um, even interesting topics such as like carbon um, credit. Um, and they have their own like, feelings about COP in general. Um, and separately, I've seen um, energy talk. So I previously mentioned hydropower, but I've also talked with um, Catherine Hoff, who is basically the secretary of energy within the IAEI, very hard to pronounce, but she deals a lot with energy. Um, she was actually a professor of nuclear engineering. And I'm like, okay, this, this is something that I'm actually very interested in. So I have an interview with her, um, which will probably later come out. Um, and besides that, uh, this was a task force displacement, which deals with a lot with like human mobility. Um, the reason I focus on this too is because there was a person who spoke about the Dominican Republic and their commitments that they're planning to make. Um, I couldn't talk too much with this person because they were in a rush, but I think it was a really great inclusion to have them. Um, next slide. I'm done. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Antonio. So much interesting stuff and on time. I can't believe it. That was phenomenal. Okay, Greta. Um, hi, I'm going to keep mine very short because this was mostly about um, our wonderful high school students who are here interviewing people. Um, so I, I would say I have 
way too much information to come back with. Um, and uh, from what I've learned at COP, um, and I think the biggest takeaway for me is, um, as an educator, is coming home and teaching climate in a different way. Um, I've through a lot of my interactions here, I've learned that um, we need to avoid climate despair and we need to make sure that we are teaching climate change and climate literacy in a way that gives people hope and makes people feel like they can make a step forward. Um, and I would say my big takeaway from this week, and there's a lot of pessimism and frustration that flies through the air at COP um, and in conversations because negotiations with this many countries and private sector and youth and indigenous people um, is, is going to be messy. Um, but I think if you saw the number of humans here from all of those different uh, stakeholder positions fighting as hard as uh, these people are fighting and um, as knowledgeable as they are, uh, you would be inspired. Um, and then I think I just really want to make a huge shout out for youth in general at this COP. Um, these five in particular uh, have been way more bold than I can be. Uh, and um, in going up to powerful people and interviewing them and making a uh, space to just get information that they, they want to learn about um, and to make change in their own communities. Uh, and then there were just so many people under the age of 25 um, giving, giving talks, um, making uh, powerful statements about including indigenous voices and youth voices and um, offering solutions and steps forward. So um, I'm gonna come home on Saturday and um, just feel full and ready. Uh, to, to keep teaching climate change and um, keep working with youth in this field. Fantastic. Take it. Thank you, Greta. That was beautiful. I echo you and take it away. Manolo. Hello, I'm Manolo. Um, I have a podcast too, all about environmental education. And my topic was actually that I was most focused on at this top was environmental education in underserved communities. Next slide. Um, so as was mentioned, there's three different zones, blue, green, and innovation, but there's also actually in New York Times climate forward event that's happening um, I didn't mention that, but that was pretty cool too. Maybe we'll talk about that. Hey, um, Manola, can you just talk a tiny bit louder? Yeah, so sorry. Um, the first photo of me was the first day at COP, really. Um, we were going in to get our badges. The real moment that hit me when I felt like I had um, power or a say was uh, when my bag actually went through the security system because it's very secure, got to go through two systems. And then the other photo is the children and youth pavilion. And this is the first ever children and youth pavilion at a COP conference. So that was pretty interesting. I'm glad they had it. And it was just a chance for youth to meet up and chat. Um, we chatted there the first day with some other youth from California, I believe. Next slide. Um, and this is really just my thoughts um, that I've taken away from COP and that we need to share the tools for climate education all over the world in, in different countries and present to school boards and even older people about climate education 
so that they have the set forward and also to not focus so much on climate doom, which is like, oh no, this is happening. Try to look for the positive stuff in the world because if you look for all the negative stuff, that will drain you. And if you don't want to become a, if you want to become a climate activist, that's pretty tricky to do that when you're always drained because I heard something every day, there's almost a catastrophe. And then um, we need to be on the same path. We need to choose one path to go forward because right now we're in a bunch of different paths and a bunch of different people are on different pages. And that's been my experience at COP. So I'll pass it along. Okay. Thanks so much, Manolo. Oh, yeah, go right ahead. I just wanted to also highlight for folks that Manolo, in addition to these other zones, has spent some time with Greta in, at the New York Times hub. And they, he mentioned it, but I just wanted to shout that out because it was particularly cool. But Tori also has something cool to say. Go, Tori. Okay, so I'm Victoria Evans. I also go by Tori. Um, and then obviously I have my Instagram right there and my email in case you guys want to reach out. I'm also part of Climate Reality Chicago, and I am an environment club between swim and water polo. So not the whole year, but whenever I can. We can go to the next slide. So I wanted to briefly cover COP's 27 central themes that we picked up on throughout the week. Um, obviously, the goals of the conference are mitigation, adaptation, finance, and collaboration. And these have been central themes throughout the entire conference, obviously, because this is what the panels and different speakers have focused on. Another big topic has been climate justice and climate equity which ties into accountability, which is another big topic considering all of the commitments made last year that have not been um, realized by different governments. And then the other one, which is very important to me is the SDGs or Sustainability Development Goals by the UN, which basically are a list of different focus areas in development that help countries develop sustainably and manage different focuses within development so that they can tailor make their actions on climate. You can go to the next slide. Um, so my focus area, obviously, like I said, I'm really interested in sustainable development and sustainable management. Specifically, I like these topics because they deal with not only people, but also pretty much every single system that you can think of on the planet Earth, whether it be finance, education, um, natural space management as well. There's always some sort of sustainable aspect that you can tie to it with development that we can incorporate into our daily lives. So just a brief explanation of the photos that I have here. I have a photo of me, which you can probably barely spot me, but I'm up towards the top left of me with the Prime Minister of Barbados, um, Mia Motley, and she gave a wonderful speech in the Youth Pavilion, focusing on these topics and especially sustainable development. Um, and then also, yes, somebody pointed out, I'm pictured there with Professor Jeffrey Sachs. He was wonderful. I went to, I think, three of his talks at this point. Um, and he was just absolutely wonderful in calling out the United States for not reaching its sustainable development goals and for not helping other countries reach their sustainable development um, goals as well. Then there's also another photo from the Swedish Pavilion. And then there's a photo of the president of Zimbabwe and the president of Botswana, as well as other leaders who are talking in the African Pavilion about climate equity and climate uh, uh, justice. So they were really focusing on financing. That was a very focal point in this COP because a lot of the time, especially last year at COP, people were not putting their money where their mouth was, so to speak. Um, and large nations have been really criticized for not contributing to helping develop developing countries um, on climate. We can go to the next one. So I kind of wanted to just cover my personal experiences and reflections because I met so many different people and had so many unique experiences that it's hard to put it all into one recap and into some short words. But um, here um, towards the top, I obviously have photos of the Children and Youth Pavilion. There's me below speaking at the Children and Youth Pavilion. I was talking about ILF and what we do. Um, then down below, I'm with a delegate from Zimbabwe um, from the party. And I today was talking about youth in America and what we can do to help support developing countries. So if you guys want information about that, definitely let me know. 
Um, then, you know, there's just other photos of me speaking. Then there's a photo of me with the mayor of Des Moines, Iowa, um, who we're trying to get in contact with for another meeting later on. But he was really um, important because he talked about uh, climate resilience in Illinois and in the Midwest specifically. So he was a great mentor for that. Um, I was <laughs> I was still describing some of my photos, but the other photos there was one of me interviewing Al Gore, and um, also one of me meeting um, an indigenous woman from California who's working on reforestation efforts in the Amazon. So now I guess we can move on. <laughs> um, so this is me interviewing Al Gore. Just a little trigger warning: the microphone is really scratchy, and I was very excited um, and flustered. So. It's not the best, but it is what it is. So just bear with me. Obviously, there's a little bit of a fumble in the middle, but there it is. Uh oh, no audio, Kristen. Next year's COP. Do you think that this? Okay, so we're here with Al Gore. Obviously, you talked today about your new um, website to help people track and keep accountable for different emissions. I wanted to ask you briefly about next year's COP. Do you think that this new tool will be used to keep other countries accountable, especially with questions about the leading countries that are addressing our, our leaders in emissions? Yeah, think I think it definitely will be used. And one of the things we found is that the oil and gas emissions are three times larger than what they've reported. And uh, next year's COP will be in uh, the UAE, one of the uh, fossil fuel production areas. But uh, even there, there are new commitments to try to make progress on climate. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. OK, 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 so we're here with Al Gore. Emmett, take it away, big story. You didn't sound nervous at all. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, Tori, I told you that interview was fine. Um, okay, hi, I'm the last delegate. Um, I'm from Evanston, Illinois, where I'm the hub coordinator for Eton Sunrise, which is a climate justice organization. Uh, we do mostly work on the local level with our school board uh, and with the city. Um, that's our mailing list in the QR code. I hope you've scanned it if you want to, because we're moving to the next slide now. Great. Uh, so a couple months ago, another local activist in Evanston who may be here, Jesse Bradish, um, asked me about my theory of change. Um, and at that point, a lot of ideas ran through my head, uh, but I didn't have an answer formulated. And I cop, I think I've come to understand a few things about change um, that I kind of want to share tonight. Um, so this first picture is the three of us that were there on the first day in the room where the parties had their opening meeting. Um, I have this in here as just a representation of how boring and slow and tedious global bureaucracy is. Um, their first meeting was a lot of just assigning subcommittees and like assigning report due dates and whatnot. Um, and I understand that global bureaucracy has to be that way and it has to be slow, but it doesn't have to be as slow as it was here. And for that, I want to turn to the second example uh, of the meetings that we went to, which was a couple of informal sessions that we attended, um, specifically one on national adaptation policy, um, where they spent the whole hour trying to get everyone on the same document. Um, and then a couple of delegates requested that they not do that the day after. Um, which I frankly agreed with. Um, that was kind of sad and kind of hilarious, but mostly a representation of how um, this kind of work can be slow and really frustrating. Next slide. So transitioning away from global politics, um, Tori already mentioned this session with the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley. Um, the main thing that I took away from this session was just the way in which the effects of climate change pervade every aspect of our lives. Um, Motley covered everything from food to economies to gender to national politics, um, all kinds of stuff from all kinds of countries, including her own. It just, the effects of climate change impact all of us everywhere. Um, on the flip side of that, the second picture is 
from a session that we attended on indigenous rights um, in the business transition. Um, and this was probably the most impactful session that I attended this year um, because it brought to my mind that not only uh, do the ways that climate change impacts the world affect us in every way, but also the ways that we respond to climate change um, affect us in every aspect of our lives. Um, I think Fatima already discussed a little bit of what happened in this session, um, but it was really about the ways in which even the green energy transition has been industrialized and especially unfair to indigenous communities. Um, so, you know, I think the takeaway from this slide, these two sides of the ways that climate change affects us is that everything about climate change affects everything about our lives. You can go to the next one. So in this kind of development of a semi-coherent theory of change, um, I landed on a community-based solutions sort of framework, which I'll elaborate on a little bit more later. But um, I want to talk a little bit about the Climate Justice Alliance Pavilion, which Fatima already covered also um, a little bit, but especially with the um, representative that we talked to there about how community-based advocacy and community-based solutions are so important. Um, and that's because of the way that they're personal, the way that interpersonal interaction um, within these community-based solutions fosters the kind of change that actually matters to people um, and not to corporations or to large-scale government operations. Um, and so those community-based solutions are kind of where I started focusing my mental energy for the rest of this COP. One really good example of these is the Tonga Above initiative. Um, the picture above is the four of us with Willie Losi, who's the uh, representative delegate from Tonga. And this is his project uh, that he's been working on with artists and architects to um, essentially make the island of Tonga livable as sea levels rise, um, building livable spaces upward um, using models from coral reefs and architectural skills. And I could go on about this. I think it's really cool. I won't because Rachel said she was going to be harsh on time. Um, but what I really want to point out here is that it's no mistake that these pictures are representative of Indigenous communities. And I know Fatima, again, already covered some of this, but really that these solutions exist outside the bounds of global industrial capitalism and multinational corporations that sponsored this COP. This COP was sponsored by Coca-Cola, among other corporations. Um, but I digress. Un it's unsurprising then that they would that these solutions would originate from the people who have been stewards of the land and water the longest and the best. Um, and I just want to echo a lot of the people that have already spoken when I just so strongly encourage everyone in the climate movement to seek out indigenous voices as some of the most trustworthy experts in this field. Um, as people, all of us as people, uh, we have the same things at stake here. Um, and listening first to those who have the same interests as you, perhaps more of the same interests as you, um, before you focus your attention on corporate greenwashing and on false solutions um, is, is the way to go about this kind of action. You can go to the next one. So I want to tie this all together with this very mundane picture of cop attendees walking between buildings. Um, everyone in this image has an idea, probably several. Some of them are similar, some of them are very different. But once again, every single part of our lives, every single part of our futures is affected by the global reality of climate change. And that means that all of these ideas of everyone in the picture and every one of the 30,000 attendees at this conference, all of these ideas are where we get the kind of change we need. Some of the 30,000 attendees are global leaders who negotiate at the highest level of, of global politics, slowly, oh so slowly, um, and it makes sense. Their ideas enter the plenary rooms and face down the world. They have to contend with the interests of every other country in addition to balancing the interests of their own constituencies. But still, they can achieve the kind of singular large scale change that we need. And I hope that this COP will result in this kind of change. But far more than those 30,000 people, far more of those 30,000 people are people like us, NGOs, businesses, activists, and people who just generally believe in our future. And though we don't yet have access to the kind of power that high level delegates hold, we don't all need it. We have ideas too. They range from school level district work in Evanston and Oak Park and Chicago to projects like Tonga Above. We work at a community level on a, uh, on a personal level with stakeholders and with people in power. 
rather than facing down the world, we only need to work with the people around us and we can affect the kind of rapid change that we need on this small scale. But we know that we need progress on a massive scale. And part of that it is the crucial and tedious work of global bureaucracy. Uh, but what I've come to understand here is that those of us who can work on these community-based projects are the integral part of the global change that's needed. Every single idea in this picture at this conference and in the minds of the people on this live stream has potential to affect our communities. And even when a small portion of these many, many ideas succeed, that's where the global, rapid, and community-based progress that we need comes from. Hey, thank you to all of our delegates for those wonderful, wonderful presentations. I really loved all the photos and videos, and I really learned a lot about your experience there. So now we'll start the Q&A portion. So if you all could please put questions into the chat. And in the meantime, I'll get started with a submitted question. So how have your educational experiences led you to follow this path? So whether in school, your environment, your community, Uh, do you guys mind if I go first? Yeah, I'll go after you. Okay, um, so I wanted to touch on my um, climate reality training because I know that a lot of people, especially in Oak Park where I live, might not have access to environmental classes or might not have space for it in their schedule or maybe they're younger and they don't have access to those courses yet. But anyways, climate reality really does have an excellent training program for anybody that is interested. And so that's where I learned a lot of my background. But I also, what was really important for this COP was my background from my McGill summer program this past summer. So if anybody else wants to learn more about politics, wants to learn more about SDGs, wants to learn more about COP or just about kind of the more political part of environmental science or just the environment in general, I'm happy to give you guys those resources if that's something you're interested in. So mine was really when um, the big snowstorm that hit Chicago in 2015, I believe. And then afterwards, the hurricanes and all the natural events that are um, gloom because or doom um, and we have lots of rain in Chicago so that's a natural disaster that still needs to change but that was in and still is in our everyday lives so that made me interested in this. Can I go next? Um, for me, I think I, I talked about this the other day, but it's just like, without being aware of it, when I lived in Mexico, I was living a much more sustainable life than when I moved to Chicago again, just in terms of like composting and growing like my own organic food. Um, but then looking back, I didn't realize because I was just a little kid, but um, like the two communities where I lived, like we had problems with flooding um, because um just of like the rising levels of water right but then in my other community we were just uh depleting like our groundwater resources so literally only up until like half a year ago they dug up so many wells trying to find water until they found water which is crazy um and like now shifting that to like present time just like um seeing just the fact that every year during the fall it doesn't feel like fall because it's still like 70 degrees in December and like November uh which is crazy I mean this year like for cross country I don't think I had a race where I had to wear a jacket um compared to last year um yeah, oh yeah uh, but yeah that's actually how my connection started and then I mean just like entering Solorio, the Solorio community and seeing um the initiative with zero waste which is our environmental club and realizing that I could take action through that club and having Kringle as my amazing teacher to learn more from. <laughs> so it was a question about what motivated us to actually become like environmentalists, because my thing started like jittering out. Yep, 
That's it. Okay, that's good looking. Okay, cool. Well, there's a few things. One, 2016, there was Hurricane Maria that devastated Puerto Rico. And there was like floods, loss of like houses, no electricity. And obviously, I feel like it's where most of my family has come from. That's where a lot of my family still is. And so I have that connection. And so I've seen like the response to it. Like, and to me, it seemed like a very cluster to say the least. Um, and I'm like, I really don't like this. I wish I can do something about it myself. Um, and then also growing up in Chicago, I'm like, we're all this. I moved to Chicago when I was about 12. And I'm like, oh, this is a beautiful city. I love it. And yet I seen like when I lived in more impoverished neighborhoods, I saw like it was tons of litter all around. I'm like, man, how can people actually just respect their environment, their community? And so, you know, I myself would like voluntarily like decide to like clean stuff up. And um, I joined Solorio in Rome and I joined the Zero Waste team. And I'm like, you know, I want to help out. You know, I want to be able to get my hands dirty, work in the garden and do any other projects you might have. And over time, I'm like, well, I'm really interested in STEM. Um, so maybe I can use that to my advantage for some reason, for some, in some way, but also my ability to just self-advocate and really just be talkative and be able to like share perspectives. That's been also very useful. That's what got me to join different groups and make the connections that I did. So yeah, that's why I'm here, I guess. So I don't know if I can speak to exactly where this started for me. Um, I remember a story that my mom told me recently where I was, I, I don't know, young, um, still planning on becoming a professional baseball player uh, for the Detroit Tigers and living with my grandparents who are here um, and very much enjoyed that I said that. Um, but I, so I, I asked my mom, like, am I, can I become a baseball player? Are we gonna figure out this climate change thing? Um, and that kind of has stuck with me since she told me that story about a month ago. Um, all that to say, I don't, I don't know where it came from exactly. I've always had some awareness of it, which I do thank the house I grew up in for, which I thank my parents for. Um, I think I can speak especially to like where I started orienting my perspective more towards climate justice um, as opposed to um, what I had thought of as solutions and the direction that I wanted to go beforehand, which is like carbon capture stuff. Um, I think that that was around my sophomore year, which was online, um, but I, that was the year that I got involved with Etown Sunrise in any significant capacity. Um, and that organization has always put a really big value on um, it, the phrases overused, but it can't be overused on the intersectionality of the climate crisis. Um, and I think that's where I really gained kind of an appreciation for just how much it affects us and how um, we need to center our action on a justice oriented framework rather than um, only being science oriented, um, only being like physical, everything is getting warmer, let's let's make it colder solutions. Um, that's a gross oversimplification of, of how this works, but that's uh, that's all I've got. I just want to jump in very briefly because it is uh, 8.55 here in Egypt. I know it's Tori's turn and um, I want to hear from her, but then maybe the subsequent questions, will we pick one person to answer so that there's time to get to all of them if possible? I don't know, maybe not. Tori yeah, already I, went. I, wasn't, I don't know that we'll probably be questions because we'll probably, we'll be ending probably at, in five minutes, but just with time-wise, but if, we want to answer this last question and then maybe choose one more. Okay, so Tasha, what is the closing statement? If everyone has last thing they want to say. <laughs> um, I think we just have like one final, I guess, end question. Like, so for the um, ad, for the environmental um, activists right now in Egypt, um, will you continue to talk about your experiences after COP27? And what actions can like local environmental activists take to continue to support your work? And maybe Tori wants to start since she didn't get a chance to chat last time. 
Um, I did get to talk for the other thing, but I was just raising my hand so I could answer some of the other questions in the chat. So I'm going to briefly just cover how we met Al Gore um, through the Climate Reality Program. He was hosting an event after the um, blue zone and green zone activities throughout the day. So that's how um, we got the invitation was through Climate Reality. Um, but I guess I can answer this question as well. Or actually, Manolo should probably because he's um, his focus area is education. So I'll pass it over to Manolo. Yeah, so um, we're all going to keep doing what we do, I bet. And um, I think most of us plan to present to our environmental clubs and our school boards if we're trying to get a plan passed or something to happen that can be a good way to convince them or push them in the right direction. Um, and you can follow each of us on our social medias, I would say, in uh, what was on our uh, which I think there will be a request in that. Okay, sorry. I guess there was also a question. I don't know who. Antonio, did you want to pop in? It looked like you were about ready to answer. Okay. I didn't want to make sure. I wanted to make sure. I just because, anyways, I'm glitching out sometimes. But from <laughs> first thing, I guess, like, am I going to continue like talking about this experience? I think so. I don't think I can like bottle it up. I don't think I'm just going to let it die. I think I'm probably share as many people as possible. Um, but also, we're planning to make an actual film um, at the end of this. We're going to make compilations of our experience. So hopefully that goes out well. We're also we also make connections with people during COP. We have made connections during COP. And so I think we're still probably going to communicate to people that we've had connections with. Um, and also people have like really interesting projects that we could probably bring back to Chicago or projects that we can bring along other people from across the world, which is really cool. Um, and for those who are really interested in actually like continuing or wanting to be more involved within the environmental community, how do you like make connections or you get to know people more, you get to share ideas, really exchange um, what possibilities are out there. Um, and also educate yourself too, right? Um, make sure first you know the opportunities that are around you, but also make sure you know like why you do it and what are the things that you're interested in. And like, for example, if you're interested in certain scientific parts of environmental problems, probably educate yourself in that. Um, and hopefully you can get a more with those things, yes. Uh, I'm gonna just jump in and mention that we actually do have a post event in the works. Uh, it'll be a hybrid event on December 6th. Uh, and so watch our Instagram and Facebook for announcements about that. It's called Cop Stories from COP27, it's gonna be uh, 40 minutes of stories from this fabulous crew and then um, an in-person youth mixer as well. So uh, Chicago area youth, get yourselves hooked up. There will be food and fun on December 6th in the evening. Great, did any other youth have a last, what they're gonna take away? I know we didn't hear from Fatima, I don't think, or Ahmed, I'm not sure. Where we sign off? I, I can just know uh, to say yeah. to this question. I mean, I'm just super excited to get back and like talk to my entire school about this. Um, because I mean, just in general, the fact that I got to attend COP tells, I think, students at my school that a lot of people care because a lot of people show up to COP even if stuff doesn't get done or if it's really <laughs> slow. But at least it, it, it brings across the idea if you're not super informed about COP, that people are there because they want to fix this. Um, so I think I would, I hope that encourages students at my school to realize that this is a matter that, that people do care about. And just in general, like in my club also, um, we try to show like improvement from year to year um, in terms of like our waste and how we've improved and just like decreasing the amount of stuff that goes into our landfill. Um, I think just trying to 
bring facts that can increase our credibility will be part of getting more people to act on this and to be more motivated to learn. So, yeah. I think I already um, kind of disclosed all my primary takeaways in the slideshow, but um, I won't repeat those. Just there's there's just so much more. Uh, we had five minutes. I probably took it to seven or eight minutes. Um, and there is so much that I'm so excited to share with the people back home, um, with you know, school board, city council, people that we are trying to um, get to listen to us on certain things. Um, and I think so much of this experience will be used both as kind of like an attention grabber, um, like you met Al Gore, but that matters far less than like what we use that attention grabber for, which is to communicate our real takeaways from this experience and to be able to use those to affect that kind of community based change um, back home. So that is I'm, I'm excited to get back, um, partially because the water is better in Chicago, too. All right, well, thank you all. It's been so fun listening to your reflections. I've had some serious FOMO going on here. Um, and um, I really uh, have appreciated the perspective on how you're bringing it back to the local level, because while this is a really complex, global, international policy wonky thing, um, I, I love that you're all thinking about what does this mean to me and how can I bring this home? And I hope folks that are watching have um, gotten that as well. Uh, we, we are all instruments of change and we all have the uh, potential to do something. So thanks for joining. Um, please follow these young people as they go forth in the world and also um, climategen.org. We'd love to have you following our delegates as well. They'll be still on the ground next week and um, in the years to come. So have a great night. You guys get some sleep and um, we will see y'all soon. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, young, brilliant people. Yeah.